Hello, everyone, again. Uh, my name is Esther Salazar. I'm a mathematical statistician uh, working at FDA Center for Tobacco Products in the Office of Science. And today I will talk about population modeling in tobacco regulation to quantify the risk and benefits to the population as a whole. Uh, as a disclaimer, I would like to say that this is not a formal dissemination of information by CTP uh, FDA and does not uh, represent agency position or policy. I will start this presentation with an overview of population modeling. Then I will uh, talk about uh, samples of modeling strategies used by CTP to date. And I will briefly present uh, some of the um, mathematical formulation and some discussions related to the dynamic population modeling approach that CTP has been using in some um, regulatory activities. And I will focus on uh, uh, input output data. Uh, I will present also uh, an example of modeling a potential nicotine product stand standard and I will uh, discuss some limitations of that framework and then I will uh, finalize with uh, challenges for population modeling for this uh, DPM uh, approach and also for other, other uh, modeling approaches. As an overview, uh, I would like to, to start saying that population modeling uh, has been uh, used in tobacco regulatory science for multiple purposes. Uh, but I will uh, focus here um, highlighting uh, two, two purposes. The first one was to model the potential impacts of uh, uh, potential regulatory policy on the population as a whole, including users and non-users of tobacco products. And the second aspect is to evaluate the potential population health impact associated with the introduction of new tobacco product uh, through two different pathways. Uh, the first one is uh, through pre-market tobacco product application, PMTA. Uh, I didn't uh, put here, but also as uh, Mitch mentioned, uh, also for modified risk, risk tobacco product application and also uh, substantial equivalence. Uh, SE pathways that are uh, clearly stated in the FDA CTP webpage. Uh, because of the changes in the tobacco market, which includes the introduction of uh, new products such as e-cigarettes, ICOs, flavored tobacco products, and other products, uh, population modeling frameworks have been adapted to account for uh, dual poly use switching behaviors between those products. Uh, so having said that, uh, this presentation will focus on uh, a modeling approach that CTP uh, used in the past uh, and limitations and challenges for population modeling. I will start giving two examples of modeling strategies used by CTP. Uh, the first one uh, started with a collaboration with Sandia National Laboratories uh, around 2015. Actually, that collaboration started before, but I'm highlighting the 2015 because that's the year when uh, they uh, researchers from uh, Sandia National Laboratories and CTP researchers published a paper in PLOS One uh, titled Modeling the Potential Effects on, of, tobacco product, uh, of New Tobacco Products and Policies, a Dynamic Population Model for Multiple Products Use and Harm, that focus on evaluating uh, the potential uh, population health impact associated with the introduction of new uh, tobacco products or policies. As I mentioned, uh, through the different pathways, PMTAs, MRTPs, and substantial equivalents, and also your hypothetical uh, regulatory scenarios. Uh, in that paper, uh, you can find uh, the mathematical framework described, the sensitivity analysis, and all the details related to the construction of that model that I, I, that I will discuss in a minute in this presentation. Also, uh, following the same approach uh, related to the dynamic population modeling, in 2018, CTP used that, that framework to quantify the potential public health effects of enacting a regulation that makes cigarettes minimally addictive, that was called the nicotine product standard. In the same year, in, 2000, in March 2018, uh, FDA issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking uh, to develop a tobacco product standard for nicotine level of combusted cigarettes. 
uh, some of the of, of the results uh, from those analyses were published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the paper titled Potential Public Health Effects of Reducing Nicotine Levels in Cigarettes in the United States. Uh, again, uh, indeed, in that paper, uh, CTP used the dynamic population model that is described in the PLOS One paper in 2015. So those are two examples of models that CTP has been used, and I will describe uh, in the next slide some of the main characteristics of that model limitations and, and challenges. Just to give you a brief uh, um, summary of what the population, the dynamic population model approach is, uh, I will uh, start saying that this uh, modeling framework uh, can be used for different scenarios. And I'm highlighting two scenarios here. One is the one product scenario when we only focus on one specific tobacco product, for example, cigarettes, and then the model can move from different tobacco use status, from never to current to former, and to different uh, transitions, uh, for example, cessation and relapse, and of course, initiation. The, the other scenario that uh, we can consider in that uh, DPM, the dynamic population model approach, is as Mitch actually uh, described early in his presentation, is a two product scenario where we can have, for example, uh, cigarettes and a different product, for example, non combusted products that was actually used in those uh, papers that I already uh, mentioned that we can have uh, nine tobacco use status for those uh, for that two product scenario. And then we can um, start analyzing transitions between uh, those nine tobacco use categories that in total we have 27 transitions. So we can explore transitions that involve initiation, cessation, switching and relapse. Uh, again, that model can be used on uh, to, to estimate uh, product use prevalence and mortality attributable to tobacco use uh, for the different products that we can uh, define in the modeling framework. This dynamic population model approach is actually a, a, a model that includes different steps and different stages. Uh, and basically at each discrete time step, T that I actually uh, I will I will say we just use in years year by year updates year by year the model updates each subpopulation I that for example includes uh, an, a specific age group sex race ethnicity um, and account for uh, different changes in the population for example birth mortality and net migration for example uh, if we start with a specific uh, year. Uh, year um, denoted by T, at year T plus one, for each subpopulation I, we start with a number of individuals in that specific population at uh, a time T at subpopulation I, and then we subtract the number of individuals that leave subpopulation I between T and T plus one uh, due to multiple changes, for example, changes in tobacco use, death, or aging. And then we add uh, individuals that join the superpopulation I uh, who don't uh, die between that um, period change. And also we account for the number of births into superpopulation I between T and T plus one. Uh, and also for changes in net, net migration uh, in, in that specific subpopulation I, because people uh, from other countries also come up with uh, different uh, tobacco use behavior. So we account for that into this model. So this is actually the general uh, uh, equation which uh, is used, uh, although we use other equations to account for mortality changes in mortality risk and other, other changes in the model that I'm not specifying in this presentation. The dynamic population model approach uh, was used to project impacts of a hypothetical scenario on tobacco use, morbidity, and mortality in the US. Examples of hypothetical scenarios include uh, introduction of new tobacco products through the different pathways, MRTP, PMTAs, and um, among others, and also implementation of uh, a new uh, policy regulation. Uh, 
For example, uh, the nicotine product standard that I will uh, describe briefly uh, in a few minutes, and also uh, the mental ban that uh, other Castor researchers are working on right now, among other um, regulatory scenarios that, that we can incorporate in this modeling framework. For a specific simulation period, the model is able to simulate different type of uh, uh, measurements. For example, tobacco use prevalence, and uh, morbidity, mortality attributable to tobacco use, and compare those outputs between a baseline scenario versus a hypothetical scenario. And the comparison is, is done because we need to see the difference uh, in mortality related to the difference between those two scenarios. Uh, I would like to emphasize here that this uh, approach, uh, the dynamic population model approach, is a deterministic model. And because of this feature, the model does not incorporate uncertainty. However, uh, to account for uh, some level of uncertainty, uh, Monte Carlo simulation was used to, to compute range estimates for those um, output model parameters, but I'm not going to discuss those details in this presentation. Input data. Uh, for this uh, modeling framework, the dynamic population model actually requires a huge number of input parameters. And I will also emphasize some challenges related to the construction of input parameters. But I would like to summarize here in this slide uh, what type of uh, data sources we use for the multiple input parameters that we used in this um, dynamic population modeling framework. Uh, for example, for the baseline scenario, we need to uh, populate the model with population um, uh, projections uh, by, sex, by sex and age. So we use the US Census uh, national population projections only for the best baseline year because the model is able to project population across the simulation period. Also, we need birth and net international migration, which is related to the formula that I present a few slides ago. And then we got those estimates from the US Census National Population Estimates and um, US mortality rates and relative risk. Uh, in this case, all cause mortality uh, relative risk uh, by smoking status, sex, and age groups. And uh, we are able to incorporate those uh, input parameters using uh, the National Health Interview Survey link mortality files. Also, we need to populate the prevalence for the different products that we incorporate in the model, uh, the tobacco use status for never, current, dual, former, and all the status that we defined in either the one or two product scenario. Um, by sex, age groups, and tobacco product use. And we got those uh, measurements from uh, different national um, representative surveys. Uh, but in these specific models, we got those uh, numbers from uh, NHIS and also from the National Youth Tobacco Survey and YTS and uh, PATH. Also, we need smoking transitions, uh, transition behaviors by sex and age. Uh, in other words, initiation, cessation, relapse, and switching. And then we were able to use the reconstructions of cohort smoking histories from NHIS data, which actually are the CISNET estimates that are available uh, uh, there. For the hypothetical regulatory scenario, actually, there are many challenges. And uh, because for those, uh, we need uh, regulatory specific values that are related to changes um, regarding transition behaviors. For example, uh, the percentage reduction is in the smoking initiation associated with the implementation of the hypothetical policy scenario, the percentage increase in cessation, changes in, in switching from one product to the other. So those are um, input parameters that we need. And for those specific parameters, uh, we, we used uh, regulatory specific expert elicitation and also um, uh, results from uh, tobacco research papers to uh, include some assumptions and numbers to populate those parameters uh, for the policy scenario. So related to the output data, for each of the uh, for each year of the simulation period, 
In this case, for example, 2015 to uh, 2100, uh, we can get uh, US population projections by sex, age, and tobacco use status. We can also get tobacco use prevalence, uh, never current dual former users for all the years in the simulation period. We can also get projected regular smokers dissuaded, projected life years gain, projected tobacco attributable deaths prevented, all those um, output parameters that are uh, important for uh, morbidity and mortality uh, decision making and among other population uh, projections that I'm not specifying in, in this slide. I would like to, to mention a little bit the, um, the, modeling, uh, the modeling framework of the, and the results that we uh, got from the nicotine standard uh, that uh, was published in the, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine and also that was used for the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for the nicotine standard that I'm, I'm highlighting here as an example of how this model can inform regulators um, for, the, for the whole projection period. For example, uh, in this specific uh, case study, uh, the baseline scenario was cigarette smoking will continue to decline based on recent trends in smoking initiation and cessation. As you know, uh, the CISNET projections for initiation and cessation shows that uh, initiation is decreasing and cessation is increasing. So then uh, those uh, changes were incorporated on the baseline scenario. And then we can see without the implementation of any regulatory scenarios, changes in prevalence and morbidity mortality in the simulation period. Uh, regarding the, the policy scenario, uh, it was assumed that the product standard is put in place in, two in 2020 to lower levels of nicotine in cigarettes and other combustible tobacco products. Uh, for example, I would like to highlight three different output parameters. Uh, the first one is projected regular smokers avoided. Uh, as I mentioned, this regulation or the, the hypothetical uh, product standard started in 2020. However, we have started the simulation period in 2015. And then we have started with um, uh, projected um, uh, regular smokers avoided around uh, 3 million. And then we started with uh, higher numbers and by uh, 2100, 30, 33 million people will, would avoid becoming regular smokers. This is the projection for the final, uh, the, the, the end of the simulation period. And then this uh, blue shade uh, area represent the range that actually were computed using the Monte Carlo simulation. As I mentioned, this model is a deterministic model, but because of the use of Monte Carlo simulation, we were able to estimate those ranges. Also, the projected uh, life years gain um, uh, by uh, 2100, more than 134 million years of life gain among the US population. That's the, the, the projection by uh, 2100. And then also the, the, the ranges for all the simulation periods that, that we can get for, for this analysis. Uh, if you are interested in looking at other results, you can you can see the link here. If if the slides are available, you can just click and take a look at other results for this uh, simulation study. In terms of mortality estimates, uh, this plot uh, shows the the projected tobacco attributable deaths prevented. Um, as a result of the FDA potential nicotine reduction policy implemented in 2020. And then uh, we can see that by uh, 2100, more than 8 million premature deaths for tobacco could be avoided, considering all the assumptions and all the input parameters that we consider starting at baseline 2015. Uh, here, I would like to point out some limitations of the dynamic population model, and I will focus on two different aspects uh, regarding input parameters and regarding the modeling framework itself. Regarding input parameters, uh, although the model can be used to run a stratified analysis, for example, by race, ethnicity, age groups, and other uh, uh, stratus, uh, and for different tobacco products, 
in some cases, uh, incorporating group specific mortality estimates is not, is not possible. And this is because of the lack of follow up mortality data and a small sample size for some uh, tobacco products that are new in the US market. Uh, also, uh, to date, uh, cost specific. Uh, mortality and morbidity data was not incorporated. As I mentioned in the first bullet point, uh, the estimates that I presented in, in the previous slide are related to mortality, uh, all cause mortality. However, uh, sometimes it would be helpful to present results related to uh, tobacco, tobacco, tobacco related specific uh, diseases, for example, lung cancer or other uh, diseases that are uh, important for decision making. Uh, but this is not possible, as I mentioned, due to the lack of data uh, for some uh, products, tobacco products, with, uh, we have low prevalence. Also, um, some CTP reported analysis using the dynamic population model uh, assume uh, constant uh, tobacco use transition rates. For example, uh, initiation rates is the same across the whole simulation period, cessation, also is, is the same switching. And as you know, uh, initiation and cessation, for example, uh, looking at the CISNET estimates are uh, varying across time. But uh, this modeling framework didn't account uh, to date uh, related to changes in those parameters. Um, regarding the modeling framework, uh, the DPM is uh, a deterministic model approach and does not incorporate uncertainty for model predictions. To account for uncertainty, we opted for running a number of simulations, uh, varying some key input parameters uh, in the policy scenario using a Monte Carlo simulation. As a result, uh, we were able to compute a range, for example, fifth and 95 percentiles for each outcome parameters that can give us an idea of uncertainty considering extreme scenarios. Regarding challenges, challenges for the DPN model, um, and actually for other population models used in tobacco regulation, uh, we faced multiple challenges. For example, one of them is regarding the construction of input model parameters. Uh, as you know, uh, tobacco use prevalence can be derived from multiple US nationally representative surveys. For instance, NYTS for youth, NHIS for adults, PATHs for both youth and adults, TUS, CPS, among other surveys. Uh, however, population estimates can be different across surveys. For example, when estimating tobacco use prevalence for different products. Uh, therefore, uh, sensitivity analysis or other analysis to account for input parameters uncertainty is needed to assess the impact of those various data sources on model outcomes. Uh, also, uh, there is not enough mortality follow-up data to estimate mortality risk associated with the use of new tobacco products marketed in the US. For example, uh, mortality data associated with the use of e-cigarettes and uh, the long health effects on users. In terms of modeling framework, uh, ideally uh, the model outcomes, for example, prevalence, morbidity and mortality uh, should be reported with uh, a certain level of uncertainty, uh, certain level of uncertainty, for example, using confidence intervals, standard errors, range values. But as I mentioned, uh, the DPN model, at least the model that uh, we use for those simulations is a deterministic model and we use Monte Carlo simulation. However, other modeling frameworks, such as probabilistic models or Bayesian approaches could be explored to uh, incorporate uncertainty for these uh, modeling approaches. Also, micro simulation and the previous talk extensively discussed uh, a very interesting framework to incorporate agent-based modeling could be used to simulate changes in tobacco use transitions under hy uh, hypothetical regulatory scenarios and results from micro simulation analysis could provide model based assumptions and input data to model the impact of regulatory scenarios. So we have actually a big opportunity here to incorporate other type of models uh, in a micro simulation setting to incorporate uh, input parameters for this micro simulation modeling. 
Also, uh, it may be difficult to incorporate uh, available biomarker data uh, from tobacco users to the model. For example, we have biomarker data available from PATH or other uh, data sources. And uh, however, this type of data could be used on mortality disease risk analysis, for example, and results from that analysis, uh, from those analysis could be informative as input model parameters in this, uh, in this uh, dynamic population modeling or in other population modeling frameworks that uh, you are um, um, exploring these days. Uh, I think that's all I have, and I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you for your attention.